And so you could have friction force less than that. And that just means you haven't reached the point where you're going to have motion. And I go over that pretty well in my lectures. Uh, so hopefully that's a, a concept that's clear. Uh, but one of the other things about friction that's different than what we've talked about before is the idea of uh, different potentials, poten different potential motions. So up to this point, you've had calculating a force, calculating a moment, and there's just one answer usually. But in friction, you can have different scenarios depending on uh, whether one object has enough friction to hold another object, and you sometimes have to look at the system. So it requires some, uh, what I'd say, fundamental understanding of what's actually happening with friction, what's actually happening when the object's about to move, whether there's going to be enough friction to hold something back or whether something else will slide instead of that. And I'll, and I'll discuss that in these examples I'm going to do. Now, wedges, uh, that's a topic that some of the instructors cover in more detail than others. Uh, the idea with wedges is the what's called the angle of friction. And that's where you, and you saw in my lecture, where you combine the Newton normal force and the friction force into a, a, a resultant force. And the angle of that resultant force is equal to the tangent, I'm sorry, the uh, inverse tangent of the friction. So if you have any questions on that, um, now's the time to ask about that. Um, it does have a few uh, applications, but most likely on in the final, you're, you may see wedges more from a theoretical standpoint, but probably not from a calculation standpoint. So uh, just to give you a heads up on the final, it's going to be a two-part final. The first part, you'll have pretty much all day Monday to work on it. It's I think it's set to be like an hour um, time limit, and it's usually like a multiple choice true-false test. And that one you'll take on Canvas. And we'll have instructors available for you to uh, ask questions um, during, the during that day. And then part two, you'll have the uh, written part, or I should say the calculation part. And that's where you'll have probably three questions uh, that'll be similar to what we've done on midterms. And you'll do all three of those, and then you'll submit them like you did the midterm to me, and then I'll grade those. So uh, I am going to uh, go ahead. Question. Good question. Um, so just to catch up on friction and wedges, if I read the chapter, I'll be all good for the final, or should I do more? Yeah, no, that's all you need to do is I would look at the, I would be sure to cool. look at this uh, lecture, and you should know all you need to know for it. Plus the finals are open notes. So although it, you probably won't have time on them to go back and watch the videos during the exam. So I would avoid doing that. Okay. But I could reference the, the pages in the book, like the different oh, book uh, tables. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. So. Cool. So what I wanna do is I wanna go through a couple of uh, examples of friction just to, and these are, these would be, uh, I, I picked these ones in particular because they would be the ideas that you're gonna use in these examples would be what you'd require you on the, on the final. So, so for example, let me go ahead and uh, change the screen. Sorry about that. Okay. So can you guys see my my uh, tablet now? Yes. Are you still looking at me, or are you looking at the my kit doc cam? I can see your doc cam. Okay, good. Okay, thank you. So, if you look at uh, the problem I have on in it, on the PowerPoint, so you can toggle back and forth if you wish. It says coefficient of static friction between block A and the incline is 0.3. And then it wants to know the ranges of masses MB where the system will remain in equilibrium. So as you can picture, if, if mass of the block is too big, then the block's gonna slide uphill. If the mass of the block was zero, then it's gonna slide downhill. And so we wanna figure out what the ranges are. Now, this type of problem, when, if you're taking dynamics next quarter, you will see that's probably the first few weeks you'll work on these. And, and the only difference is what you'll be given is something like this, only you'll be asked to determine 
the acceleration of block A. And so instead of setting things to equal zero, you'll set them equal to MA. So these types of problems aren't really that tough in dynamics. You just you kind of got to work through the, uh, the nomenclature and, and make sure that you understand and draw a good three block diagram. So what I've done in the doc cam is I've drawn the um, three body diagram. Here's this is the start. Here's the block. You have two tensions. So we're just going to call T. So there's two tensions going up this way. And then here's the other um, on the other side, the other block or uh, part of it. So first thing I want to do with my FBD is So we know we have a normal force A, we have our 100 pounds coming down. We know that we have two T going up. And this, in this case, because we have two situations, I'm gonna draw the friction force in both directions. So what I'm gonna do is, is um, you can, you could draw two of these if you want to, but just for simplicity, I'm gonna say that the friction force points up if we're going to slide down. And so we know that that's just going to be equal to mu static times n. The other time friction is going to point the other way, that's if we're going to slide up. In that case, that's also mu static times n. And so that I think is a good visual because it tells you which way it's going to go depending on. So like obviously we want to look at both situations. So first thing we'll do is we'll say, well, what happens if it's going to slide down the ramp? We'll slide down. And so in that case, uh, we can figure out well, what is our first, what's our normal force? So if we, and on these problems, it's always good to tilt the axis. So I'm going to make the axis like this. So there's your Y, there's your X. So we're going to sum the forces in the Y to zero. And really what we get is Na minus the weight times cosine 25 degrees. And when we do that, if we substitute in the 100 pounds, we get Na normal force equal to 90.6. So now that we have that, we can go ahead and we'll figure out what is our equation for going up the ramp. And so uh, if we sum the forces now in our x direction, we have 2t plus mu static times n. And that's where it's important because the 2t and the mu static are pointing in the same direction when it's sliding down. And then the only other forces minus the gravity, 100 pounds times sine of 25, all equal to zero. So if we go ahead and we substitute in our values, because we know, let me put Na here, sorry. So we know that this is 2t plus 0 0.3 times 90.6 minus 100 sine 25 equals zero. We get t equal to 7.54. Professor, could you move the page up a little bit? It's cut yes. off on the bottom. How's that? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for yeah. Interject if I do something silly because I can't. I can't see like right now. I'm all I see is the uh, screen. Let me see. I should probably stop sharing and show this. Why is it showing? Anyway, sorry, I'm having a technical issue here. Okay, so, so we have the 7.54. So that means that as long as you have 7.54 pounds, that block's not gonna slide down. So this object, this here has to weigh 7.54. So that's our lower end. So we'll say mass B, and we'll have 7.54 is less than or equal to mass B, which is less than or equal to and now we'll calculate what the other one is. 
And so for that, we pretty much do the same equation. And the only difference is mu, in this case, mu static is going to point down. So if we change this and just say sum of the forces in the x to zero, and this is for sliding slide up, sorry, slide up, then we end up with 2t minus mu static and a minus 100 sine 25 equals zero. And so in that case, if we go ahead and substitute in like before, we get T equals 34.7. Okay. Oh, but sorry about that. So that's 34.7 pound, but that's not the mass of B. I don't know why I said that because we still have to count this, this over here. Sorry about that. So what we know is that the tension, I should have done is this, the tension has to be between 7.54 and 34.7. But now we have to count for this pulley. So now if we look at the pulley, you'll notice that there's one tension here going here. And we think of our weight, if we draw a line through it and cut it, that means there's one, two, three. So what our free body diagram for that pulley ends up looking like is There's T. And there is. Professor, could you recenter it for me? Yes. Absolutely. Thank you. Is that better? Yeah. It's one of those days. There we go. Way to B. And then you have three T's going up. OK. Does that make sense to everybody, the way I cut that? So I cut that here, and I know that three tensions equals W equals the mass of E. So if we do that, then really what it comes down to is that um, three T uh, for upper and lower. So three T equals WB. So we can say three times 7.54 pounds and that equals 22 points point six pounds or three times 34.7 and then that equals 104.2 so what we end up with then finally is our massive b is in between those values 104.2, 22.7. All right. Does that make sense, everybody? Sorry, it's a little rough there. And the tensions will always be evenly split in this sort of situation? Yes, because uh, remember that any times you have pulleys, they have to be because the cable is one continuous cable, right? Oh. Yeah. So if you cut it, it doesn't matter because you can't have more tension in one. But if the other. they were different cables, it, then it would be different. Uh, if they're connected to different locations, yes, but I've never seen that in a statics problem, at least. Oh, not cool. Before. So yeah. That makes it a lot easier. Yeah, it'd be a completely different system. Then. Okay. So, let's look at this next next one. Now, now this, uh, this problem here, uh, this one was actually out of your textbook. And what I like about this one is that you have, you can, you can kind of rule away part of the answer right away just from looking at it. So for example, uh, when you see, it says two slender rods of negligible weight are pin connected at C and attached to blocks A and B. And so, uh, we're only given the weight, each weight is W. And so it says determine the largest value of P before movement will occur. Now, if you look at that, if the friction coefficient's the same, 0.3 under both of them, and you push down with P, which one's gonna move first? 
Okay. Which one? A or B? I'd say A. Okay. Yeah. Which one? A or B? I'd say A. Why is that? Because more of the vert. Oh wait, but P is at an angle. That's all right. You were on the right track. Because... But I w- go ahead. I would say W because the moment arm is longer. No, that wouldn't do it. But maybe no, no. Just... It's e- well, it's either A or B because they both weigh the same. Okay. Well, more of the vertical component is going into the ground and thus the normal force. So it's more vertical on point B. Right. So that means that B is going to have a, a higher friction coefficient. Oh. Not coefficient, I'm sorry, friction force. More for And so W is going to slide first. And so that's mechanically, that's something if you can recognize that. Now you could prove, we could prove it with math, but it will save you a step in this problem, which I'll show. Now, uh, so what I've done in the, if you look at the dot cam, I've drawn this. And first thing, and this one's a little tricky because what first thing we want to do is we want to figure out is how is P transferred? So how is P transferred to these two bars, um, AC and BC? And so if we draw, if we look at the location C, right at C, then what do we have? We have this P coming down, and we know that that's at 80 degrees, that's 10 degrees. We know that we have AC coming there, and that coming there. Let me just label those. So we know that's 30, we know that's 60. And so this is my force AC, this is my force BC. And so we know all three are coming together. They have to be in equilibrium. So there's P and there's those three. So we can draw a force triangle from that. And so if we draw a force triangle, it's going to look kind of like this. We have BC coming up. And we know that BC and AC are 90 degrees to each other. So we can draw that coming off of there. So that's my force AC. And then I know my P, it just comes back down to there. So now we have to figure out what is the, what is the actual angle. So if we think about it, this angle turns out to be 20 degrees. And the reason for that is if I were to go ahead and draw this again, and you could take it on faith now, but later on, if you're not sure, you could draw this. So this is my 10 degrees here. And then if I have another line that comes in at, and this is, let's just draw it straight through. So we know that this has to be 10, but we know that whole angle is 30. So this part here has to be 20. So that's why that's 20 degrees here. So what that allows us to do is it allows us to relate the force AC and the force BC to P through this right triangle. So what we can do is we can say FAC equals P sine 20 degrees and FBC equals P cosine 20 degrees. And so I normally don't do extra equals, but I'm going to. So 0.342 P and 0.940 P. So now I've defined FAC and FBC, okay? So now, now that I have that, that was kind of the first part. Now I'm going to look at block A. Since block A is the one I'm assuming is gonna move first, I need to draw the free body diagram for block A. So I know that I have a normal force A. I know that I have a weight. I know that I have FAC. And I know that I have friction force A going that way. Okay, so that's just my, that's just block A's FBD. So I know that if I sum the forces in the Y zero, I get NA minus W minus FAC sine 30. 
but I also know that FAC equals 0.0342P. So what I can do is I can bring this down and substitute it into here. So that leaves me with NA, oh, that all equals zero, sorry about that. Um, NA equals W plus, but it's moved to the side, 0.342p times sine 30, or Na equals W plus 0.171p. And what you'll find with a lot of friction problems is there's a lot of substitution as you relate the normal force to the friction force. So, so we have this relationship, we'll have that, we'll call that equation one. And then let's go ahead and look at what happens if we sum the forces in the X. So to do that, I'm going to sum the forces in the X to zero. And what do I get with that? I get um, the friction force A minus FAC cosine 30 equals zero. And so again, I know what FAC is. So now what I can do is I can write FA, right, equals 0.342P cosine 30. And so then if I do one more, I get FA equals 0 0.296. All right, so that's equation two. So what I, again, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to figure out what is P in, in relation to W, right? Because I don't know what weight. If I gave you a weight of 100 kilograms, then you can calculate P. So, I, so now I can, I can, I'm almost there. I can almost finish this and maybe you can see what's, what, what I have. I have, what I have is NA and I have FA, don't I? Well, we know that if it's about to slide, we know that FA equals mu static times NA, or you can also write NA equals FA over mu static. So, well, I know what NA is up here, and I know what FA is here, and I know what that is. So what I'll do is I can rewrite this as W plus 0.171p, which is NA, equals 0.296p all over coefficient of friction. So now I can multiply both sides by 0.3, distribute it, subtract from the other side. And I, if I do that, I get P equal to 1.225. Now, that is, it. so if I had, let's say that I didn't know that A was going to move first, I could have done all that step the same exact way with the same free body diagram for B. And if I had followed that through, what I would have found is that for B, that uh, P equals 1.3. 0.329W. So in this case, I have the two answers. It means that this is the more, more conservative. This will slide before that. So that's the maximum P that you could have in order for it to work. Make sense? All right. Okay. A couple more. Um, and then I want to talk about the test a little bit. So the next one has a, this one actually looks harder than it is, but it's actually goes fairly, it's fairly simple. And again, you might see if, the reason I do a lot of these is because I want to kind of, I want to familiarize you with the different stuff types so that when you see something on the 
exam, you're not uh, thinking, how do I possibly do this? So there's a certain mindset to all of these friction problems. Uh, again, free body diagram first off, but understanding the mechanics helps immensely also. Now, so for example, on this problem, you have this 10 foot beam, you have a mass that weighs 1200 pounds and you're trying to move it to the left onto a platform. And so, so you have this horizontal force P, it's applied to the dolly and and some frictionless wheels. So even it, unless I tell you there's friction at the wheels, you assume it's frictionless. But so you're given that X is equal to two feet and the coefficient of friction is 0.3. And that's assumed that's between the surface uh, A, the beam and where AC is. So now you want to determine um, how far, how much force is P. And there's this little note there that says Dolly is higher than the platform. So this is actually very important to note in this because what it's saying is that if I were to um, draw this, let me draw the platform kind of in an exaggerated way. If this is my platform here, and this is my beam, this is, again, this is exaggerated. What it's saying is that basically the dolly is like this. And so because this is higher than this, all of the normal force is at that one point at D, and all of this normal force is at this one point at A. So that does make a difference in the way the problem is, is done. Um, so with that, uh, we, we're gonna then draw our free body diagram. And because we know that the normal force is at A, that's where it's contacting. We know we have a friction force A going to the right. We know that the distance um, from NA to the normal force at D then is going to be eight feet because we're given that that X distance is two feet. And we also know that we have a friction force on the dolly. And that's because as we try to push this object to the left, we're going to end up with some, uh, the, the obviously the dolly, the, Dolly is going to want to prevent it from moving. So the friction is going to point to the opposite direction. So one of the things we want to do, and, and so if you're looking at this, you're like, well, what's the first thing that I do? So I want to find this imaginary P value. All right. So, but P is not even on this. So what, what do I do? So. Are you going to need the moment? Yes, because you're going to need to figure out what these normal forces are, and you're going to need to figure out how much force is actually required to overcome friction. And that's how you want to think about these problems is they're static, but as soon, what's it going to take to overcome the friction? And so since you're overcoming the friction, you know it's going to be the friction that is F equals mu static times N. So in this case, let's first figure out what is our normal force at D. So if we sum our moment, at A, zero, we know that we have the normal force at D times eight minus 1200 times five, Let's do complex math, and we get normal force at D is equal to 750. So we know that normal force at D plus normal force at A has to equal 1200. So some of the forces in the Y direction, we know that normal force at A then has to be 450. So we have these two values. So now what we can do is uh, we know that if we try to push this thing to the left, either this is going to slide onto the ledge or the dolly is going to slide underneath it, right? So if this was the dolly, it's either going to push this whole thing like this, or you push it and the dolly just slides. And that's how we have to compare friction. So, but because the friction coefficient is given as 0.3 and ND is bigger, we can see already that the dolly is going to have higher friction force than the other side, isn't it? So we can say FA friction force at A max is just going to be equal to 0 
times 450, and that gives me 135. FD max is equal to 0 0.3 times 750. That gives me 225. And so, um, so we know that it 225 greater than 135. So therefore, if we think about the beam like this, and we draw it again, then we can assume that this dolly under here, if we apply a force P here, that this force here, as long as P is greater than friction or 135, then this whole thing is going to move to the left. Okay, so as long as P is greater than 135 pounds, it will move. So, does that make sense? So you don't always have to have lots of formal drawings and, and calculations because sometimes the problem will just intuitively, when you're looking at it, figure it out. Now, uh, Professor, I have a question. Yes. Um, what would happen if it was over 225? Just like a random instant force was 225 pounds. Would the dolly move under it? Oh, you mean if A was over 225? Or I think it's P. Oh, if P was over 225. Oh, well, no, because if it anything, because as soon as you exceed 135 pounds, the whole oh. thing is just going to move like this. Right? Okay. Because you basically think of it as you have you have two, here's your object. You have a contact point there, a contact point there. And so it's like, which one is going to resist motion? This one fails at 135. So once you reach that, it's just the whole thing's going to move. Okay. All right. Thank you. Sure. Okay. I got one more problem to do, and then we'll talk about the test. How do you do these so fast? What do you mean? That was insane. You did that so fast. Well, I'd already done it before. I, oh, so I write my notes. I write my notes ahead of time. I, so you're saying I should break into Cal Poly and get my hands on the test and work it out beforehand? Yeah, I would. That, okay. I won't tell you where it's hidden, but yeah, that's that works out. Okay, so this last one uh, is. It looks it looks really tricky, but it's actually again it's just again it's it's looking at the system and understanding what's going on. Now, here we have a uh, cylinder and a block, and we know that the cylinder is going to spin, and if it it's going to spin and it's going to move the block over. Now, but that's one of two situations as you can picture it. So it could either spin in place, right? If the friction coefficient or friction, I'm sorry, force is too low here, it'll just sit and spin, block won't move anywhere. However, if the friction force here is less than friction created here, then the whole system will move to the right. So that's where you have these two different situations that you have to account for. So first thing again, any of these, uh, you want to draw your free body diagram. So what we want to find is what is the moment. So what moment is applied here in order to make this whole thing move? Now we know these two are in contact. So we know one side has a normal force. The other side has a normal force. And they're both the same normal force. We're assuming there's no friction between these two. They're smooth. So we don't need any friction there. Um, we know that this is, of course, going to have normal force we'll call C, since that's object C. We know it has a weight coming down. And we know that if it's going to spin like a tire, like that, then friction is going to point that way. Now, the thing is, in dynamics, it turns out friction points the other way. But you know, let's not get ahead of ourselves. So, so um, just remember that this is an all absolute. Motion changes things. So, yes, sir, can I interrupt you one more time? Sure. Um, would rolling resistance have any impact here? That's just kind of red flag that went off in my head. Uh, it, it would if we were accounting for it, but you're correct. There would be, but so 
in these problems, because we haven't really delved into that, we limit that. So we're not going to put any rolling resistance on the final. So I guess my question is like, where would rolling resistance really fit into this? What's assumed here? Uh, well, ro well, rolling resistance uh, would account for once this object was in motion. So it would be if it were a dynamics problem, because remember, okay. when we're looking at this, we're on the cusp of motion, but we're not yeah. actually moving. Yeah, we're still in a zero force. Okay, cool. Thank you. Sure. So we have that. And then let's go with, we have the weight here. We have our normal force B. And we have our friction force. B. There's everything. All right. So we're given that we know that this is six kilograms, that's three kilograms. All right. So let's convert that right away. We know that, um, let's call it C, B. You know, the weight of C is 58.8 Newtons, and the weight of B is equal to 29.4 Newtons. So you have that. Um, now, in any of these types of problems where you're trying to make something move, I always recommend starting with the object that's being forced to move. Because really, when you think about what you're trying to figure out is, if this thing's going to move, how much? What's going to what's going to be required to make it move? How much force is is required? And this is actually pretty easy because we don't have much going on here. Um, for one, is if we look at this, if we by inspection, we can see that the normal force. Let me just say for, right more systematic. So block B, we know that the normal force B equals the weight of B. And we know that the friction force B equals that normal force against the other thing. So now the max friction is simply going to be FB equals mu times NB. And we're given that as 0 0.5 times 29.4 because 0.5 was our coefficient for this. And so we know that's just going to be equal to 14.7 newtons. All right. So that tells me now that I know that, I say in order for this to move this, that the friction down here has to be greater than 14.7 newtons. So if, for example, I calculated this and the friction was, say, 5 newtons, that would mean the maximum friction. That would mean this would just sit and spin before it could ever move back. Now, from observation, we can kind of tell that that's going to be the case, that it's not going to sit and spin because this weighs twice as much as this, yet its coefficient of friction is of less than half. So most likely, or we know that this is not going to sit and spin, rather it's going to move back. So let's go ahead and look at what happens when we um, look at the cylinder? So draw a line here. So cylinder, we have NC equals W again. And so, and then um, FC max equals and I'm just going to write out 0.4 times 58.8, and that equals 23.5. So we know that's the maximum friction, 23.5. So now, now it's just a question of, and, and now we're almost done with the problem because what we can determine, piece of paper here. Um, is that if we look at the, the cylinder, we know that this, this force here has to be 14.7 Newtons in order to move the object, doesn't it? So if this rotates and that force is 14.7 Newtons, this thing's going to move. Well, we know that it has a radius equal to 0 0.2. So 
So if we want to calculate the moment, the moment is just equal to 14.7 times 0 0.2. And so we get a moment equal to 2.94 Newton meters. And there's the answer. So not a lot of calculations, but it does require you to understand what's going on. And that's really where friction isn't something where you can just plug and chug. You have to, because the math's really easy, but the concept can be a little tricky. Okay, any questions? All right, we got a few minutes. Let's talk about the final. Uh, I do want to have a review session. Uh, I like to do that with you guys instead of just saying see you in a week. Good luck. Um, and so the uh, we know that um, this Friday, and I'll record the review session. So if you can't make it, you can at least uh, see it or hear it. Uh, hopefully, you guys don't have class at 3 p.m. this Friday. Um, so in that review session, I'll discuss the format in more detail. I kind of went over it a little bit already, and I'll say a little bit about it now is that, the, as I said, there's two parts. There's the multiple choice true false that will be done and you'll have, I think, 60 minutes to do it. I, I have, we haven't defined the time, but I'm pretty sure it's 60 minutes. It might be more. And uh, you'll just do that at your, whenever you can on Monday. Uh, and then the, I'll talk about the primary topics. Now, you can assume that for the final, it's going to be weighted heavier to the stuff we haven't uh, tested you on. So what I would say is you probably want to study, you want to make sure you have a strong handle on chapter six. So trusses, frames, machines, uh, friction, centroids, moment of inertia. Usually what we do with that is we'll give you um, a question about moment of inertia in, in the written part, the second part, where you'll have uh, a shape, kind of like the quiz, might be a little more complicated, but it won't be, you know, it won't be really hairy. It'll just be something that'll have, either, maybe it's a square with a part of a rectangle or part of a triangle or part of a circle cut into it. And you'll just have to calculate your moment of inertia. So I did grade the moment of inertia quizzes. And I'm a, I say that, um, you know, some of you guys did really good, but some of you seem to not to struggle with the concept of the parallaxis theorem. So if that's still not something clear, please, please, please see me in office or ask about that on Friday. Probably won't be much on uh, chapter three or four. Uh, they'll probably have a 3D equilibrium type problem from chapter four, but typically we don't we don't do too much on moments. I mean, there'll be some, but not too much. So it will be weighted heavier um, to the latter half. But don't. But that doesn't mean you know I'm not guaranteeing that nothing from earlier won't be on it. But we tend to try to weigh it heavier towards the second half. So and also submit a question. So the four. The, so Friday's review session will. We'll, I'll probably talk for 20 minutes or so. Um, go over some things. And then I'll open up for questions. So that's really the time if you want to have questions about specifics, anything goes, about homework, whatever, that's the time to do it. And then, of course, our final exam is on Monday, uh, next Monday, and you, you'll have the 7 to 8.30 time just block off. Now, if you have more than, uh, if, this is three, if this is a third final you have in a day, then let me know. Um, we can work around that because it's not really realistic to take three finals in a single day. So uh, let me know if that's the case. Just shoot me an email or something to figure it out. So any questions? Go all speak at once. So you happy, go lucky, ready to go. You guys get, um, ready for your finals? Wait, um, so the final is Monday, the common final, right? Yes, this coming right. Monday, week from today. That's correct. So, that's so hopefully that'll be your only final, and then you can have your spring break be two weeks instead of only one week. So that's what I always miss about uh, winter quarter if you don't get a month off. But uh, school, year's, school year will be over before you know it. So, okay, well, uh, if you have questions, come to office hours. I'll start my room office hours this week. Uh, I'll be, and then, um, and then otherwise I'll see you guys at, on Friday at three o'clock. I'd highly encourage you to come to that time. 
uh, if you can't make it, I, like I said, I will record it, but uh, um, just uh, do what you can. So I want you guys to do all well the test. Just a heads up, uh, daylight saving starts on Sunday. Ah, yes, that's right. So, Pesky daylight saving. Yeah, right right for finals week. That'll be fun. That's true. All right, well, yeah, well, be sure you set your clocks. Because actually, I, did, I never had anyone miss a final because of it, but I did have someone come into class and, and they came in, I was just finishing up class and they were king, oh, no. king. I was, and then I told them that, oh yeah, we missed it. And they thought, of course I was yanking their chain because I'd like to do that a lot in, when I'm in live classes. But, uh, so yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's something that I don't know why we don't get rid of it, but it is what it is. We have it. So, all right, let you guys go. Thanks for coming. I enjoyed it. And I'll uh, see you soon. Take care. Thanks professor. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.